everybody. Remember me? I'm a camp counselor now, and I've developed some new and improved camp appropriate dance moves that you can use whenever the spirit moves you, or whenever those little whipper snappers are making you want to lose your salvation. So let's get going, huh? Ready? Here we go. One, two, one, two, three, four. We're taking some mana. Put it in the basket. Yeah. Don't take too much, because it'll turn the maggots and get stinky. Woo! Yeah! Start to sweat, because I'm in a fiery furnace. Yeah, can you believe it? Flames licking my body, licking my body, licking my body, licking my body. Okay, here we go. Yeah, we're doing great, everybody. It's in the face, remember? Yeah, here we go. We're Joseph in the pit. We're Joseph in the pit. We're Joseph in the pit. Claw, claw, scramble, scramble, scramble. Claw, claw, scramble, scramble, scramble. And we're great. This isn't in the Bible, but it should be. <laughs> anyway, stand at attention. Keep those clothes on, let's be modest. We don't want to get too crazy now. Yeah, we're doing it. Let's go nuts. And then, same story, but a different action. Yeah, you're doing it. Snip, 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 snip. We're doing it, everybody. Just don't confuse that one with another one with snipping. Oh boy. This one's good for all you ravers out there. What's it saying? I don't know. What's it saying? I don't know. I don't know. Many, many, take a little parsley. Means you're in trouble. Yeah. Oh, guys, I feel like I'm gonna be sick. We're just on you. Keep going. You can do it, okay. This one is funny. Kind of disturbing, though, for the Bible. Hey. They're laughing at the bald head. Go one up, you bald head. Yeah, and then bears come out. Bears come out, and they tear a limb through a limb. They're tearing them apart. They're tearing them apart. Here we go, okay. Take your eyes off Jesus, because then you fall down. And you say, oh, up like the Red Sea. And split, and split. We're splitting, we're splitting. Split, split, split. Now, this is important because you could say, I'm a DJ in one of those fancy clubs, right? Like this. But watch what happens when I change the face. Now I've lost an ear. You know, when they betray Jesus? Yeah. That's me. Kick the ear. No, kick the ear. Look. Get it back now. Kick the ear. And then put it on or just about healed. Let's get back to some oldies and goodies, huh? Just about what we're trying to down. Salt. 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 Just about dead, guys. I can't do it anymore. We're getting there. But then I'm going to take it down. So take it down, take it down. Drowning in my own sweat. Drowning in my own sweat. Right. We're good. We're good. Right. Have fun at camp this year, everybody. Have fun at camp.
welcome. We miss you all. Stay strong, St. Mark's. Hello, St. Mark's partners. We miss seeing you at the 830 services at St. Mark's, but hopefully we'll get together again soon. See you then. Good morning. Glad you could join us today. We're looking forward to a great sermon. Good morning, friends. Welcome to St. Mark's. We're so glad you're here. Hi, welcome to St. Mark's. Glad you're here today. We welcome you to worship this morning, and we invite you now to sing one of the great hymns of the church, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Now I welcome you to join with us in confessing our sins to the Lord God and then hearing those wonderful words of mercy and forgiveness. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May we pray, please. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we, may, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us now confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Let us confess together. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. May we pray, please. Gracious Lord God, you encourage us to sit at the feet of Jesus, your anointed, and to listen to him. In the midst of the distractions in our lives, quiet our hearts and open our minds to receive your word, the living word, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. In 
peace, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. For the reign of God and for peace throughout the world, for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We are people here who have come to give you praise for the strength to live your word. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Thank you. 
Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to St. Mark's. I'm Pastor Paul. Thanks for joining us online this morning. We're going to talk about how stillness is greater than busyness today as we continue our Greater Than series. Just a quick note, you can always download sermon notes online at stmarkscr.org. We want to dive into this this morning. The message is based on Psalm 46 and Luke 10, verses 38 through 42. Feel free to move to those spots in your Bible as we get going here this morning. I'm so glad that you're with us. This is one of these topics that um, every once in a while pastors preach to themselves. Not every sermon does a pastor really relate to completely, but this is one of those messages uh, that is kind of preaching to myself because I'm not a very stillness kind of guy. I am a busy, like to be worked, like to go fast kind of guy. And we're talking today about how stillness actually is greater than busyness. Let me start off by saying this. We live in a culture that overvalues being busy. It's really interesting. We live in a culture that overvalues being busy. In fact, the United States of America is probably the busiest country in the world. The great debate going on right now with COVID-19 is can we restart our economy? Why? Because we are worker bees. We get things done. We lead. We do not follow. And we are busy people. But our culture overvalues being busy. Let me tell you what I mean. In 1971, the Living Bible came out. It's a translation of the Bible that's probably not completely accurate, but it was a little bit more fluid. And a phrase from Proverbs came through that translation that people clung on to, and I've heard it. I heard it as a kid growing up, and I still hear it today. But the phrase is this from Proverbs 16, verse 27. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. Idle lips are his mouthpiece. Have you ever heard that before? Really, it's an it's a interesting translation of a verse that actually says in Hebrew, a scoundrel or an evil man plots evil, and on their lips it is like a scorching fire. I don't know how we got to idle hands or the devil's, I always remember it as playground. I don't know how we got to that. But that's what I remember growing up. My father, my grandfather, a teacher, somebody saying, you know, young man, if you're idle, that's where the devil's really going to use you. What I want to say here at the beginning of this message is that I'm not talking about being busy as in having a job. Having a job is a good thing. You've been created to work. Martin Luther really talks about uh, being in the image of God and somebody who works uh, and uses their skills to glorify God. So I'm not talking about being busy with work. I'm talking about busyness, 
That's the difference here that I'm talking about today. I know that some of us uh, are really struggling right now because we're not busy, because for, for multiple reasons, uh, we're not at work right now. And so I want you to hear me clearly. This is not a message about uh, the, the ill effects of going to work. Definitely not. It is about busyness. It's about busyness, not working hard. We seem to be in such a hurry to get back to being in such a hurry. Have you noticed that? We seem to be in such a hurry to get back to being hurried. And I don't understand why. You see, in every situation, God presents opportunities and God speaks to us in different ways. This last week, I read four articles from business magazines or online, Forbes, Fast Company, Indeed, Psychology Today. They all talked about how busyness is destroying our workforce, about how busyness is actually not good for the person or for the place. And so I find it interesting that we are so quick to just return to busyness. More than that, though, besides Forbes and Fast Company, indeed, Psychology Today, the Bible tells us that busyness is not good for us, and it prevents us from hearing God, which is where I want to talk about today in our message, how stillness allows us to be with God and how busyness prevents us from that. Will you open up your Bibles to Luke 10? I want to talk about the story of Martha and Mary when Jesus comes to their house. Luke 10, verses 38 through 42. This story has been preached on and books have been written about it and it's been taught about a lot. But I think one of the main messages of this story is about busyness and being still for a little bit to listen to Jesus. This is what Luke 10, verses 38 through 42 says. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and will not be taken away from her. Busyness prevents us from hearing God. Martha is a busy bee. She is a doer, and I completely understand her. I am probably more like Martha than I am like Mary. I like to get things done. If I've got somebody coming over my house, I want to make sure it's clean, even though that's not what my house is like most of the time. I want to be prepared. But in this situation, she doesn't understand that she has Jesus, the Son of God, coming to her house, and she's more consent, concerned about cooking the chicken than she is about actually listening to Jesus and what he has to say. Busyness prevents us from hearing God. It's a little bit like a jackhammer. Here's a picture of a, a jackhammer here. This is not even a super strong one, but you know how loud jackhammers are. They're so loud. People have to wear protective uh, ear coverings. Outside of my house right now, I'm very thankful to the city of Marion. They're redoing the road right outside my house. But it has been so noisy. My son, Toby, he's not taking naps anymore because he can't. Because we've got jackhammers and we've got things scraping up the road and trucks coming in and out and the sound of beep, beep, beep. You know what I'm talking about. All a lot of busyness. It's a little bit like our lives when we are so busy. The noise of our life prevents us from hearing God. And that's like Martha in this story. She's textbook busy. 
And she even blames Mary for not being busy with her. This is why stillness is greater than busyness, and it always will be. In the great scheme of things, how God looks at us, God tells us to be still. And that's because that's where God works in our lives. If we are too busy, if our hearts are filled with busyness, we can't possibly know the heart of God. That's why stillness is greater than busyness. And let me just tell you a few things about that happen when you become still. When you are still, the first thing that happens is you understand what's most important. I have a picture up here of what's most important to me. This is my wife, Ellie, and my son, Theodore, and Tobias, and we're on a walk. Uh, this is on Tower Terrace Road, at least part of it. And I think to myself about this picture, this is the middle of the day. Theo's stuck at home. He's not at school. And so we have this opportunity to go on a walk together. And I know that many of you are uh, spending a little bit more time with your kids and uh, because of COVID-19. And on some level, it's a, it's a forced spending time with them. And it's interesting, there are, there are days, well, let me repeat that. It might be every day that Ellie and I look at each other and we say, wow, this is hard, having both of our boys here all the time, constantly needing our attention. But when you're still, you get a chance to look at a picture like this and you get the chance to realize what's important to you. You know, this week, I learned that my son Theodore, who's in kindergarten going into first grade next year, he's starting to read full sentences. That's part of his homework. I don't think I would have known that if I was just busy all the time. He's starting to do arithmetic. I'm so excited to teach him some math. Uh, what is five plus three? Uh, six, no, it's eight. Let's put some oranges together. These are the things that I get to do with him. And I'm not sure I'd be able to do that if I was just constantly busy. When you're still, you understand what's most important. Have you taken some time to be still and ask yourself what's most important in my life? That's one thing that happens when you're still. The second thing that happens is you hear the Father's words, I love you. You hear the Father's words, I love you. And if the father were to speak those words, the father would say, I love you just as you are. No need to prove your merit by going faster or harder or higher or longer. God is not impressed by your busyness. God is not impressed by all the things you do. And here's the reason why. God created the world in six days. And then what did God do on the seventh day? God was still. God was still. God understands that we need stillness in our lives. And I firmly believe most of the reason for that mainly is, is because the Father wants to say, I love you. The Father wants you to know how deep and how high and how wide his love is for you. It is so important that our children during this time hear, I love you. In fact, during every time, hear, I love you from parents. But you know, if you're going so fast, sometimes I love you becomes meaningless. Have you noticed that? If you're running out the door and you shout, I love you, it doesn't really have the same impact as coming up to your kids and kissing them on the head and saying, I love you, or, or grabbing your spouse and giving them a hug and saying, I love you. If you're going too fast, you don't take the time to say it like you mean it. And if you're not still, you don't hear the Father's words, I love you. Just like children, we need to hear the Father's words, I love you, Paul. I love you, Ellie. I love you, John. And we need to hear those words on a regular basis, especially now, during COVID-19, whatever's going on in your life, you need to slow down, be still, and listen to the Father's still, quiet voice that says, I love you. 
just for who you are. You know, something parents can do today is you can grab your kids and you can whisper in their ears, I love you. They need to hear this. They don't know everything that's going on with COVID-19, but they do know, need to know that their parents love them. When you're still, you understand what's most important. When you're still, you hear the Father's words, I love you. And when you're still, you get a chance to sit at the feet of Jesus. I, uh, I love these older pictures here. And if, if you could see this picture, Martha's there. She's got like a duck in her hand. I, these pictures are great. She's about to rip its head off, you know. She's ready to serve Jesus the best of what she's got. And what I love about this picture is that her house is a mess. Is anybody's house a mess I mean, it reminds me of how she's got onions and peppers and apples, and there's fish over there, and somebody's cooking on the stove back there. There are people in the back room. She's got pots everywhere. There's another chicken hanging out. I mean, it's a crazy picture. It is a crazy picture, and it looks so much like Martha, and it looks so much like my house. (laughs) It looks cluttered, and it reminds me that Being still spiritually is not the lack of movement, but focused attention on God's movement. Let me rephrase this. Being still spiritually is not the lack of movement, but being focused on what God is doing in your life. You see, I I imagine your house might be a little bit like this. I imagine you have a lot of busyness going on in your house When you're still, you don't stop everything that you're doing. Life continues to go on. But instead, what you do is you focus on God's movement. Do you see in the picture Mary? Everything that's going on around her, she's concerned about one thing. She's listening to Jesus. She's sitting at his feet. She's hearing the words of the Savior. When you're still, you get a chance to sit at the feet of Jesus. You do that in prayer. You do that in reading Scripture. You get a chance to sit at the feet of Jesus. You know, I truly believe that this season that we're in as a nation and as a world fighting this virus is a time where where God is whispering into our ears saying, I I want you to take an assessment. I I want you to slow down and I want you to realize what's important in life. I'm not, I've been listening to different preachers and and there are some preachers out there who are being very prophetic in their messages and and they're talking about, you know, this plan that God has had for a long time and things like that. I'm not really saying that, but what I am saying is this. If you're not taking time right now to reassess your priorities in life, you're missing out on what God is shouting maybe with a megaphone to the world through, through this pandemic. This is a time for reassessment of priorities in life. That's what God's saying to the church right now. I know especially for us at St. Mark's, God's shaking things up here. God's saying, I've got different plans for you. Pastor Paul, you came in here six months ago and you had all these plans laid out in your mind and I'm I'm putting them, you know, out, out to pasture. They're leaving and I've got something different in mind. I want you to reassess your priorities as a church and certainly as individuals, It's time for us to reassess the priorities of our life. Pam Schultz, our executive director, and she's still spending some time with family ministry, uh, had the opportunity this last week to spend some time with kids. And they asked kids, what are you doing right now during quarantine that you want to continue when we get back together? And a couple of the responses I think are pretty eye-opening. A fifth grade boy said, I don't want to be so busy with activities. I want to be with my parents more. A fourth grade girl said, 
I don't want to rush to dance and sports. I want to have more time at home. Do you hear what our kids are saying to us? And Pam had a conversation with one of her friends. Her friend said, her friend said this, at first I was upset for my kids because they were missing dance, archery, music lessons, and our other activities. I'm starting to wonder, does our family really miss them? Maybe it would be better if, we're, if we weren't doing all this stuff all the time. It's a time to reassess our priorities in life. The responses of the kids should give us pause to think about what's important to us. Jesus says to Martha, you're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. In fact, there's only one thing that's needed in this life. Mary has chosen what is better, and it's not going to be taken away from her. You know, when I think about this story, I have a funny question that comes to my mind. If COVID-19 was happening during this time with Jesus and Mary and Martha, would Martha still be working her tail off? Would she still be as busy as she is in this story? If COVID-19 was in her life, would she still be as busy as she is in this story? Or would she sit at the feet of Jesus? What would you do? You're living COVID-19. If Jesus came to your house, what would you do? Would you stop and be still and sit at the feet of Jesus? Or would you just keep on running in life? I want to end by sharing this great psalm, Psalm 46. I drive past a Methodist church on my way back and forth uh, to St. Mark's, and they have had this scripture passage up on their sign since the beginning of the pandemic, and it it comes from Psalm 46. I'm going to read it to you here in just a second. Um, but I want to just end with understanding that life is too short not to be still. Do you understand that? Life is too short not to be still. Most of the time we think life is too short not to go fast. But the reality is that life is too short not to be still and know that God is God and I am am not. Psalm 46 says this, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I love that. The Apostle Paul says, I want to know God. I want to know Jesus. Many of our songs that we sing, we talk about knowing God. If you want to know God, you need to be still. You've got to slow down everything else in life. You've got to rip, rid yourself of that busyness and sit at the feet of Jesus. You know, in Scripture, it's in the stillness that God really works. When you look at Moses, he meets God in a burning bush, in stillness, in a cave, in quiet. Elijah, after he's just finished from Mount Carmel, he's on Mount Carmel, he brings down the fire of God. It's an amazing scene in the Old Testament. And he runs away, and he's listening for God, and an earthquake, and a fire, and all this other stuff but it's God coming in the stillness when he realizes that God is truly with him. And then, of course, 
one of the great stillness moments of Scripture, the greatest moment, is that morning of Jesus' resurrection. After the stone was rolled away, there was quiet. But Jesus had risen. He had given us the victory. And we get to meet him in that stillness of his victory and claim that life that he has for us. Let me ask you right now just to be still for a moment. Think about what's important in your life. Listen for the words of the Father telling you that he loves you very much. Sit at the feet of Jesus. Open up your Bible this week. Take some time to listen to the words of God. Life is too short not to be still and know that God is God and we're not. We pray with me, let's pray. Heavenly Father, come speak to us in the stillness now. We want to hear your voice. We want to see you move in powerful ways. We know that you are God and we want to know you more. So teach us to be still. I pray especially during this time of pandemic, God, that you would help us to reassess, to look at what's important in life. It is so easy, God, to be busy people. Help us to not be so busy that we can't sit at your feet for a while. Learn from you, love you, and to know you. God, be with us this week. Thank you for your word. We love you, Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Now that you have heard the word of God proclaimed, I invite you to join your voices with the voices of the children of God throughout the world and throughout the ages in proclaiming your faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. I invite you now to join your hearts as we pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. May we pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, your grace is sufficient for us. Renew us through the power and work of your Holy Spirit Turn the hearts of all people to you in the midst of this time of suffering. Bring healing to the brokenhearted and the lonely. Help those who are struggling financially. For those who run or work for businesses large and small, help them in this season. We ask your presence with those who are fearful in the challenging and difficult time, especially as they look to what's next whether it be in their workplaces or in their day-to-day lives. Father, we ask that you bring healing to those who have been hospitalized, including Jeremy and Dick, Ralph and Judy, and those we name in our hearts. And Lord, watch over give strength to and guide all who work in healthcare professions. Watch over those who work as first responders. And we also ask that you would bless and help Jean-Jean and Christy as they lead United Christians International 
and all of their elders and other leaders, their teachers and of all of their students. And Father, we ask that you would protect that community from the COVID virus and bless them in this time of, of trial. Now into your hands we commend all for whom we, we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, children of God, as you go on your way, may God go with you. May he go before you to show you the way, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over you, and within you to give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I invite you now to join your voices and your hearts as we sing another one of the great church, the hymns of the church, Amazing Grace. Thanks for joining us today at St. Mark's. We want to just share with you some ways to give here at St. Mark's. You can give online, stmarkscr.org. You can text to give as well at St. Mark's, and then also you can mail in any gifts. We just want to say thank you for all the donations that you give. The last thing I want to share with you is that at 3 o'clock today, we are having a drive-in communion service. If you haven't heard about that, that's okay. You didn't need RSVP or anything like that. You can show up at St. Mark's today in your cars, 3 o'clock. We're going to actually have a special 30-minute service where we celebrate communion. We'd love to have you there. Again, it's 3 o'clock today, a drive-in communion service at St. Mark's.
And now, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.